So let's see. We have like seven people. Well, is this the first experience for me uh, in giving such uh, online lecture and uh, in English also? So I hope we will not have any technical problems uh, in case in case we have some you can uh, put your messages in chat i hope chat is working at least i can write something in it so if something can hear me and everything is good you can send something in chat just for me to know that everything is goes all right okay so it's not that easy to prepare everything for proper work well i will be giving you a short introduction in uh, the course of nanotoxicology uh, firstly i will describe you uh, what uh, how i will assess your marks uh, how we will ha uh, help this course uh, what you will need to do uh, about exams and so on and next we will move to lectures uh, well uh, all of these uh, lectures will be available for you on youtube so the same link you used now you can use to rewatch this video and uh, basically i used youtube because i am familiar with youtube and uh, i think the quality of uh, video on youtube and quality of audio is far better than in zoom sessions uh, so that's why we're all here uh if we have uh if we have any uh, technical problems uh you can uh, again send message in chat and also if you have any questions you can send them also in chat during the lecture i'm reading all the uh, all the uh, all your entries and if we have some really big problems i am available in whatsapp so you every one of you probably know my phone number so you can just put some messages in whatsapp so let's move then uh, to uh, what we will have here uh, basically we will have eight lectures uh, today first lecture is a very introduction uh, in nanotoxicology uh, i will be give you a short examples of everything we will be learning in our next lectures and today also we will have an introductory test and this test is needed to assess your input knowledge so your basic knowledge and this test and results of this test will not be counted in your final mark so i can uh, kindly ask you not to google not to uh, use any uh, any type of materials to give a proper uh, correct answers i just want to know if you're familiar with nanotoxicology or not so all other tests it's like one two oh, let me uh, like this one uh so one two three four five six seven eight tests uh all of them will be counted in your final uh, mark as you see this test is placed somewhere in the middle of the lecture so uh, i will be give you a link Today, uh, today introductory test will be a test not for the for your knowledge, but for the system. But uh, because I never used such a online test system, and uh, I don't know exactly how it will work, good or not. Uh, so we will try today, and if something will go wrong, we will correct this. So in the middle of every lecture, starting from third lecture, uh, which will be in a week, I will be I uh, will give you a link to test. In the middle of the lecture so if you miss this link there is no opportunity for you to answer these tests so please uh, attend to the lectures uh, so in the middle of the lecture will be uh, will give you this link and you will have 20 minutes to uh, perform this test 20 minutes 20 questions uh, so in lecture 3 will be test for lecture 2 in lecture 4 will be test for lecture 3 and so on and so on uh, last uh, test for lecture 8 will be right on the exam uh, along with the final test 
so to test uh, in exam day. Uh, this is one part of the assessment. And the second part is presentations. So I don't want uh, from you to make any useless work like performing presentation for uh, unnecessary topics. So I want to give you something really useful, at least I hope. Uh, all of you studying different things and I'm not familiar with all of them but uh, because of this uh, because of this I, I hope you have a link to common Google Drive disk with a common folder uh, with my course so it's uh, should uh, it should be sent with, uh, to you from study office this link uh, let me probably show you show you how to show something like this okay so uh, you have a common folder uh, nanotoxicology course uh, the student support folder and in this folder there is a table here uh, with all of your surnames uh, and also uh, well with the mails I don't know why you need it uh, but there is a, a column called object of research to be filled by student so you need to fill this column with your object of research just a couple couple of sentences for me to know what you are studying so i know that some of you study in spider silk some of you study in magnetite and so on uh, well what report topic will be uh, i will give you a report topic based on your object of research uh, and connected with nanotoxicology so if some of you study in magnetite i want from you to prepare a short uh short research uh five lists five minutes presentation about nanotoxicity of magnetite that's all and i uh, if you if you will be able to incorporate this uh short report in your master diploma it will be wonderful so I don't want from you to make any unnecessary and uh, completely useless things. So I uh, I wish uh, uh, that this can be a part of your master diploma. So uh, a couple of sentences about your project of study and I will fill this maybe today, maybe tomorrow report topics so you can uh, access them and check what the uh, what's your topic is uh, and if you have any questions of course you can again uh, ask me ask me about this anywhere you want uh, well about uh, presentations so presentations will start from uh, next tuesday december the first and presentations will be in zoom room so the link is here you uh, you have this link in your schedule schedule is placed in the same folder uh, as all non-toxicological materials will be and uh, well how uh, how i will choose there are 16 of you so we need to perform at least three people uh, in each day except for the last one where there should be like four people uh, you can uh, no, well we will choose people to present uh, to give the presentation for example after lecture three on lecture four so during this lecture i will ask if there's any volunteers to present their reports after the lecture three if there's no volunteers i will just randomly pick you up from a list and uh, well you are next you are next you are next so uh if there is any volunteers please let me know via i don't know in, you can place your surnames in chat uh, with the, i want to be for example on tuesday first or maybe friday first and so on so five list of uh text and five minutes of your presentation no more so three people it's like 15 minutes 20 minutes so wouldn't last long uh, and also you can uh, not just you can you must download your presentations and your reports in the same folder where you just saw a reports list so you can create a folder with your surname and put put your report there uh, and about uh, well assessments uh, let's clarify this so you will have eight tests 20 points each 20 questions 20 points so 160 points and presentation it's like 40 points uh it will be like uh, 200 points after all uh, and uh, well i wouldn't uh, repeat all of this uh, 170 plus 
plus uh, it's a five grade and so 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 on uh, again, a brief uh, repetition of what uh, I just said. Uh, every lecture starts according to schedule at 15.20. Introduction, introductory test will start now. Uh, every other test will start in the middle of the lectures. Uh, presentation, will, uh, presentation session in Zoom will start 15 minutes after, uh, after the lecture end. So we will have like consultation after the last lecture and about the exam. So I will give you final test, uh, test number eight, final test, and I will calculate these marks. Uh, and if you have like a five grade, uh, well, excellent, you, uh, you have five grade, uh, there is no need to perform any exams additionally and answer uh, some questions. But if, if you have like four and you want five, well, you can answer some additional questions, like maybe a couple of questions uh, and increase your mark. So uh, finally, for you to understand again, so with the uh, whole, uh, it's a whole of your group, uh, uh, like uh, 17 people here, but I believe that uh, Christina are not with us anymore. So it's like 16 people. And for example, uh, if you, uh, your test uh, marks will be like 18, 15, 20, 17, and so on. And uh, for presentation, I will assess uh, a quality of your text and the quality of your presentation, so soft skills, 20 points each. So if you perform something like this one, it's okay. I need to move my head probably uh, or make like this one. So uh, if you perform something like this, you go at 181 and uh, you're wonderful. It's an excellent mark. So if you perform, uh, if you miss any of this test, it uh, will definitely fall below 170 and uh, you will have just a four grade mark. So please do not miss the tests. Again, test will be given to you in the middle of every lecture. Uh, if everything is clear for you now, I hope uh, that everything is clear. If you have any questions, uh, do not hesitate and contact me directly via email or in chat or in WhatsApp or in contact or some other ways. Uh, if everything is good, if there is no questions, let me just check if we have some people here. We have like 13, 10 now. Well, definitely not everything here. Okay. Uh, any, anyway, we need to proceed. So now I will be sent to you a link to your first test, introductory test. Uh, you need to use your email, scumt email, to enter this test. So scumt it more. You need to enter, uh, enter this uh, email when you will receive a link. So copy link and I'm sending it in chat. Uh, well, basically you have like uh, 20 minutes to perform this test. I will be waiting for you to finish this test and after, well, it's, it's not very now it's suitable to wait, but uh, do you know online, I mean online le lecture, but I will wait. And uh, if you have any problems with us accessing this test, you can again put some messages in chat. Basically, I can watch if some of you start in this test. So, okay, Alina is uh, good. Alina, Alina in progress, I see. Uh, well, if there is no problem, I will uh, start something. So, uh, I will start with terminology. Terminology is not very interesting topic, but we need to clarify what is nanotoxicology is. So basically, nanotoxicology is a study of nanotoxicity. It's obvious, but uh, it's not that uh, easy for some people to understand what is nanotoxicity, because nanotoxicity can be uh, 
will review it from two different points. Uh, first one, uh, first of all, uh, nanotoxicity is something that occurs only at nano level, on some molecular level, maybe on cellular level. But uh, some people said that nanotoxicity is something that associated with the use of nanomaterials. And basically, this is uh, this is more uh, correct uh, designation because uh, really nanotoxicity is something that is caused by nanomaterials. Uh, but nanomaterials is a very wide uh, area of different formulations, and uh, among them there can be some maybe not nano but micro materials, uh, and all of them can cause some nanotoxicity outcomes. So. Uh, basically, uh, the question is, does this mean that nanotoxicity occurs on the nanoscale? Well, it's uh, not. It's not on the nanoscale. It uh, can spread uh, far from a single cell or single molecule. Uh, so the next question is, how far can spread the nanotoxicity outcomes? Uh, and uh, we will answer this uh, questions a, a bit later, but uh, it can spread a, a really, really far. And uh, the most important question here: If this, uh, all of this, uh, all of this non-toxicity is so dangerous, so and can spread now uh, far from a single cell, can it be treated by some ways? So uh, we'll start from uh, nanoscale and so on. Uh, well not only at nanoscale. If we look uh, at the scheme of human organism, you know, well, nanoparticles can easily enter the human organism by a lot of ways. So we can inhale them uh, and they will affect our lungs, for example. We can uh, undergo some exposure through skin, so there's a lot of particle in our air that can uh, sedimentate on our skin and uh, penetrate through skin because uh, some of the nanoparticles can be like 5 nanometers or uh, even less but let's say 5 nanometers is something of uh, the minimal size of nanoparticle so they can penetrate the skin and uh, enter the circulatory system for example in our blood uh, of course, we can eat them or drink them, and uh, uh, as far as I heard, there's a lot of uh, talks about uh, microplastic, uh, because uh, if I remember correctly, every week we eat like six milligrams of microplastic, so we eat like a credit card every week or something like this. So it's a lot of things that we eat and we do not pay uh, much attention for it. So nanoparticles can easily penetrate our organisms with food and with drinks. Uh, and also, uh, also there's uh, a lot of other ways. Uh, for example, if we inhale, uh, inhale some nanoparticles, they can uh, cross a blood-brain barrier. Uh, to be uh, precise, there is no blood-brain barrier in our uh, nose, so nanoparticles which uh, came to our nose can uh, directly go to the brain, and the nanoparticles will, uh, which rest in brain can be there for weeks, months, and even years. So it's uh, very hard for nanoparticles to exit, let's say, a brain or other organs. So nanoparticles can cause a lot of diseases, even uh, Alzheimer or Parkinson diseases uh, can, be, uh, can be caused by some nanoparticles. So uh, as you can see, uh, uh, outcomes of nanoparticles exposure not only at nanoscale at all. Uh, and uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, people uh, intendedly, let's say, use some things like uh, silver containing toothpaste with nano silver, uh, nanoparticles of silver, argentum nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, if you ask me, it's not the best options after all, because, for example, Argentum is very toxic. And uh, as we will see later on maybe some next lectures, uh, uh, tolerance of, uh, for Argentum in our organism is almost of the same level as for bacteria. So if uh, researchers, investigators of this toothpaste will use uh, silver ions concentration which will uh, which uh, able to kill bacteria it definitely will kill our endothelium cells in our uh, in our mouth in our uh, uh, well in our teeth 
So only one outcome possible uh, after using this uh, silver container to space is that you become a dead smooth. So this is disease called Argyrius. It's an accumulation of silver in your organism. And well, this is not very healthy state to be honest. So uh, how far can spread the nanotoxicity outcomes? Uh, well, basically it can spread uh, far from a single cell, as I said, and it can, uh, can spread from a molecule level uh, far to an organal uh, level. So some organelles like nucleus or mitochondria can be affected by nanoparticles. And next it can spread to a cellular level and cause uh, cell death, which will definitely cause some damage to a tissue and uh, damage to tissue obviously called some inflammation or something like this and will this will affect the whole organ and this can lead to a death of the whole organism and death of one organism uh, can be you know, like this of many organisms and a whole population may die and uh, more important here is that some of the nanoparticles they are very you not know, very non biodegradable so if you eat some fish for example and there's a lot of nanoparticles accumulated in gills and liver of the fish uh, even in muscle and uh, all we eat in fish mostly muscles and there's a lot of nanoparticles uh, that can accumulate there so basically if you eat a fish uh, which uh, undergoes some exposure to silver nanoparticles you obviously again turn to a dead smooth so it's a uh, very very um, serious concerns about uh, pollution of, with nanoparticles of different uh, waters, lakes, seas, and so on. So, about non-toxicity and can the non-toxicity be treated? Uh, basically, yes, because uh, every sign of nanotoxicity, well, we're not treating the uh, nanoparticles itself. So, it is very hard to eliminate nanoparticles uh, when they are already in liver or in kidneys or in spleen. Uh, and even in lungs. So it's a uh, four main organs in human organism which accumulate nanoparticles. Now, uh, till maybe five years ago, lungs uh, was not the primary target for uh, nanoparticles exposure, but for now, lungs are one of the main organs which are uh, reviewed as uh, one of the target for nanoparticles. And uh, if you look on this scheme, there's a lot of ways for nanoparticles uh, and uh, a lot of ways for biodistribution. So from a circulatory, uh, circulatory system, from blood, nanoparticles can uh, easily go to every organ basic, based on their size. So size uh, here is one of the crucial parameters. And if nanoparticles is very small, like uh, five, uh, five nanometers and less, they st go straight to the kidneys and eliminate with urine. If they are a bit a, a bit bigger than five nanometers, uh, they probably can go further. For example, in liver, uh, along with kupfer cells, and uh, in some ways they can disassemble, disintegrate in uh, smaller particles, and then again in blood, uh, and the cycle repeats again. Uh, so the uh, the best way for nanoparticles to exit, let's say, the body is with urine, with feces, with uh, uh, some other uh, liquids, uh, but not with tears. Uh, I never heard that uh, nanoparticles can exit the body with tears. Uh, so uh, and one of the better way is some kind of metabolism. So biodegradation, for example, magnetite nanoparticles can undergo biodegradation and uh, the obtained uh, iron can be used for hemoglobin, for example, uh, or other iron containing proteins. Uh, so if we look uh, on this uh, let's say picture, uh, there's a lot of different toxicity outcomes of nanoparticles. So on molecular level, the main mechan mechanism for nanoparticles toxicity is uh, ROS formation. So reactive oxy oxygen species, uh, they cause almost 90% of different uh, side effects of nanoparticles. So also it can be some kind of metal toxicity, but metal toxicity is also connected with ROS formation. Uh, it can be some physical damage to membranes, for example, or it can be even something very tricky like protein bi uh, binding. Uh, and when some nanoparticles <coughs> bind proteins, it means that other part of organism are 
uh, let's say have a lack of protein for some uh, purposes or maybe not a part of organism part of a cell uh, so it's just a disruptance of metabolism uh, of a single cell for example uh, on cell uh, cell level there can be also a lot of different uh, damages like as i said mechanical damage uh, it can be inflammation on a single cell level or maybe on organ level already it can be antibody formation, macrophages overload, and if you overload your macrophages with nanoparticles, there's uh, no macrophages left for other uh, toxicants or viruses or bacteria, so it can cause some bacterial inflammation, for example, in your organism. And on organ level, mainly on organ and uh, whole organism level, it's mainly connected with inflammation of different kinds, so lung inflammation, uh, heart inflammation, especially kidney inflammation, because kidney is a filtration system of our organism. Uh, so, uh, if we look on how many uh, effort uh, uh, was put in non-toxicological uh, area of research, there's a lot of papers published in recent years, and uh, this year it's already like 5,000 papers and the number slowly but increasing because there's still despite the more than 100 uh, le uh 100 uh, history of studying of nanoparticles there's still a lot of things that uh, researchers uh, didn't know so a lot of things to study because there's so many nanoparticles there's so many different coatings functionalization different uh, different uh, interactions with cells or molecules so it's still a lot of things to study and uh, when we're talking about nanoparticles uh, we first need to start from synthesis because well there's no no, no nanoparticles without synthesis even in a case uh, when nanoparticles occur naturally, uh, naturally from some source like like mines maybe or something like this, but we'll discuss it later. So synthesis approaches. Uh, I will show you just one slide here because we will have a separate lecture next lecture I think on different synthesis routes, uh, routes from nanotoxicology nanotoxicology perspective. So uh, if we look on uh, synthesis methods, there are basically three of them. It's a chemical, uh, historically first one. Uh, it's a physical methods and uh, well biological methods, or also called uh, green synthesis. So chemical methods, <coughs> uh, it's uh, like maybe well, it, it was the uh, were the first methods to use by Faraday, maybe one hundred years ago. And you probably can even repeat it uh, by using some gold salts and uh, uh, dissolve them in your tea, very concentrated tea, and uh, some nanoparticles definitely will occur. But in chemical synthesis, there's a lot of different reagents uh, which are not always very healthy for a human, human or animal or plant organism. Uh, so chemical synthesis also always involves some chemical reagents uh, which can be hazardous for your organism. Uh, and also you, uh, uh, you may perform some coating processes, some uh, post-synthesis modifications, uh, but anyway you need to use some toxic components. Uh, usually, not always, but usually you need to use some toxic components or precursors or something like this. Uh, so the next uh, method, uh, group of methods, it's a physical methods, uh, and among them, uh, the most used one, it's like a laser ablation, vaporization, pyrolysis, or something like this. So it's an um, uh, illumination, uh, some metal plate, for example, gold plate, with a very short but very powerful laser impulses. So if you uh, eliminate some metal plates, a lot of particles with different sizes uh, and different uh, shapes will uh, like evaporate from the surface. So it's like metal evaporation uh, at a very high temperature, but at very, very small point. So I will show you um, electron pictures of this metal target after ablation process. 
it looks very nice uh, but after this method you are also able to obtain a lot of different particles but mainly these physical methods used for production of inorganic particles uh, of course there's some methods like uh, maybe uh, i don't know evaporation using some em emulsions to produce liposomes or something like this but it's uh, on a cross between chemical and physical methods uh, and the last group it's a uh, biological methods uh, methods so uh, called green synthesis when you use some plants plants extract extracts uh, bacterial cells uh, even a whole animal organism so it's some uh, researchers which used uh, a whole mouse to produce nanoparticles uh, inside this mouse and uh, well i don't know for which purpose it, it just <laughs> it just can be uh, achieved so well green synthesis now uh, are very popular but only because uh, it can uh, eliminate some steps like using very hazardous agents so uh, as for me it's still it's still like a very nice nice toy so uh, biological synthesis need to be further investigated adjusted to produce something really valuable something with very precise sizes composition and so on uh, and because uh, uh, we're talking about different nanoparticles parameters uh, we definitely need to discuss which uh, nanoparticles parameters are really matter if we discussing uh, well if we're discussing what happens to nanoparticles in an organism so what matters now there's a lot of nanoparticles parameters uh, that can be considered with, when we're talking about nanotoxicity so basically uh, for sure it's a composition of these particles so composition really matters uh, everyone knows that silver nanoparticles are more toxic than gold uh, gold nanoparticles or magnetite particles and there's a lot of different uh, other different uh, elements like uh, i don't know cadmium or zinc uh, which is also very toxic in some concentrations but uh, among these parameters uh, well of course size and shape uh, also matters because uh, now for now we know that the smaller the size the bigger the toxicity and uh, for some uh, shapes uh, we know also that some shapes are not very toxic and sh some sh shapes are toxic even if the nanoparticles are of the same composition uh, surface charges are also known to you know, make some contribution in uh, overall toxicity surface coating functional groups targeting light uh, ligands and so on but sometimes some uh, very narrow parameters of particles can contribute to overall toxicity so among these parameters like crystalline structure which are always uh, usually not considered at all so amorphous or crystalline doesn't matter it does matter and state of nanoparticle segregation so uh, nanoparticles can be aggregated or dispersed in a media and this strongly affects uh, nanoparticles toxicity and uh, if we look on a variety of different nanoparticles there's a lot of them liposomes polymer particles micelles carbon nanotubes dots uh, different cyclodextins quantum dots uh, and pure bare, uh, bare uh, gold nanoparticles there's a lot of them and looking on them uh, it's become obvious why it is very hard to study the nanotoxicity of all of these uh, things uh, and uh, also if we uh, combine these things for example we cover gold nanoparticles in a polymer shell in a liposome and put this uh, uh, decorate this with quantum dots and uh, next cover it with dendrimers it will be very hard to assess this uh, toxicity of this formulation so uh, historically the first thing that uh, really matters is the size so size really matters when it came to nanotoxicity if we look on this scale uh, well what is nano size basically nano, uh, nano sized object is everything which is smaller than one micron of course it can be still called like uh, 800 nanometers but to be honest it's not a nano because it's like sub micron uh, 
as if you ask me, uh, everything that, uh, which is smaller uh, 500, uh, smaller than 500 nanometers, well, can be called like nano. So 500 nanometers, uh, it's a limit for uh, in every dimension because nanoparticles can be not spherical, they can be like elongated or cubic or something like this. Uh, but the smaller the better. Uh, the ideal size for nanoparticles it's like 50 nanometers, 100 nanometers. Uh, it's the best uh, for uh, bioapplications and so on. And uh, also nanoparticles can be as small as one nanometer. Uh, and uh, if you look on uh, upper scale, uh, it's the size of single protein. So, for example, human serum albumin is a uh, one of the most abundant proteins in our serum, it's, uh, it have size like maybe five nanometers or something like this. And DNA molecule, uh, depending on uh, amount of the nucleotide bases can, uh, can have the size of 10 nanometers, maybe 20 nanometers. So uh, virus particles like coronavirus uh, have size of maybe up to 100 nanometers. So some of the nanoparticles can be uh, uh, of the same size as some of our molecules in our organism. So the cell is much bigger, the cell like maybe 10 microns, uh, 50 microns, uh, 100 microns. So the nanoparticles definitely are much, uh, much more smaller than a separate cell. And uh, if we're talking about uh, size and uh, why the size uh, does matter, because the smaller the size of nanoparticles, the bigger the surface. Uh, total surface of these particles and the bigger the surface uh, much more different uh, ions can be released from this surface and cause oxidative stress so it's a basic uh, principle of nanoparticles toxicity uh, but not always uh, it's just uh, well you can uh, predict nanoparticles toxicity uh, and you will be like 80 uh, percent accurate when you talk about size and that uh, the smaller the more toxic but not always uh, and if we look uh, on um, a study of size dependent toxicity there's no publication about size dependent and nano because uh, it became obvious only like 20 years ago and uh, as i said the history of nanoparticle study is like uh, 100 so for now it's a lot of uh, papers published on uh, size dependent toxicity of particles and if we uh, come to the biodistribution in our organism, size also uh, still matters because depending on the size, nanoparticles can easily penetrate different organs. For example, if they are small enough, they will accumulate in kidneys, in heart, in lungs, and the, if they are big enough, they definitely will accumulate in liver and spleen. And uh, also it is connected with uh, other sizes. So. Uh, the size is one of the most important parameters of nanoparticles. Uh, but not only size. Uh, shape also matters because for now scientists are able to synthesize almost any shape they want. So it can be like nanoflowers, nanospheres, cubes, uh, rods, uh, different lines, uh, bars, prisms, and even 50, 50 types of uh, nanobiopyramids. So probably, probably, but uh, no one can be sure here, all of these samples have its own nanotoxicity profile. So probably this one will be not very toxic because some of them have like uh, spherical, uh, spherical edges, uh, edges, but this one have very uh, sharp edges and probably will be more toxic. But uh, the shape almost the same, but uh, very small details sometimes really matters. So these nano rods uh, have very, uh, very smooth, uh, very smooth edges and probably will be not very toxic if it's not uh, from a silver, for example. Uh, and nanocubes usually, well, have moderate toxicity uh, when compared to nanospheres of the same size. Uh, so the shape also uh, really matters. Uh, and in some uh, in some cases, uh, for example, this nanoflower have a very big uh, surface uh, surface area. So the bigger the surface area, again, 
uh, much more ions can be released from a surface and uh, probably this particle will be very toxic. Uh, well, what else matters? Charge matter. Definitely charge matter because nanoparticles, uh, almost all nanoparticles, have some uh, surface charges. And these charges are uh, usually called uh, zeta potential or some other names can be used. Uh, but zeta potential is not uh, the same as uh, surface charge. We will discuss this now on our second or third lecture. So uh, this is a very nice research uh, which was devoted to the study of different sizes, shapes and charges and uh, more important bioaccumulation, not just single cells. Single cell uh, and cell cultures, uh, this is not very interesting. Uh, studying the whole organism, uh, uh, this is what really interesting. And if we look uh, on biodistribution of different sizes, uh, again, as I said, very small particles will definitely accumulate in kidneys. Uh, not accumulate, they uh, will excrete with urine, uh, but uh, they will go straight to the kidneys. So it will be hard uh, for macrophages to uh, phagocyte these particles and deliver them to liver. So they, with flow, uh, with uh, blood flow, they will definitely go straight to the kidneys. So uh, as for the other particles, uh, there's a lot of them can accumulate easily for example bigger particles will definitely accumulate in lungs liver and spleen uh, why in lungs because lungs it's uh, not a filter uh, not a part of uh, mps system so filtration system of our organism but still there's a lot of blood uh, which pass uh, through lungs and there are very small capillaries here no, so lungs uh, definitely accumulate a lot of particles and there's a lot of concerns now because we inhale a lot of nanoparticles, especially if we live uh, somewhere in Chelyabinsk or something like this. Uh, and uh, if you look on shapes, uh, there's also a lot of shapes, but basically it's something uh, close to spherical, to rod-like shape and disc-like shape. Uh, and about disc-like shapes, uh, it was a lot of papers uh, because our erythrocytes, uh, red blood cells, uh, they're looking like discs. And some, some researchers suggest that using some disc-like uh, particles probably will reduce the toxicity, the immune response, and so on. But, well, nope. Uh, it doesn't, uh, well, it matter in some way because if you look on spleen structure, spleen structure have some filter system and erythrocytes, when they pass a spleen, they pass in not like this one, they pass in through this filter uh, with their si site. Uh, so, uh, yeah, some particles can definitely go through spleen. And if you, uh, you, if you look on this distribution, uh, there's like, uh, uh, well, same distribution uh, for, uh, for, for these particles. But for kidneys, uh, because of all of these particles are of the same size and much bigger than 5 nanometers, uh, almost uh, no particles will accumulate in kidneys. And uh, finally, charge. Uh, negatively charged, positively charged, and uh, with no charge. So natural charge, let's say. Uh, well, there's a really uh, a big uh, difference between negatively and positively charge, and the answer is very very simple. Well, our cell membrane have negative charge. So if the membrane, cell membrane, I mean, have negative charge, so another particle have positive charge, definitely they will interact just electrostatically and. Uh, since uh, there's a lot of uh, Keplers, there's a lot of tubules in our spleen, in our liver, which filtrate the blood, uh, it definitely will accumulate in uh, the cells with negative charge, so in, in all of the cells. Uh, that's why charge really matters when we uh, talking about nanotoxicity. If we want to eliminate, uh, if we want to uh, uh, make uh, so the cell will uptake the nanoparticle it's better to provide a positive charge if we want for nanoparticle to uh, to uh, await uh, macrophages or some other cells we we will probably use some uh, negatively charged particles so negatively charged particles are the best options uh, but there's some very tricky things about zeta potential and stability, which we will discuss on next lecture.
<coughs> and uh, of course of course composition also matters uh, so uh, there is a lot of there is a lot of different elements uh, which uh, uh, can be used to produce some nanoparticles so historically one it's uh, gold nanoparticles silver nanoparticles magnetic nanoparticles made from iron or nickel uh, uh, silicium nanoparticles titanium zinc oxide and so a lot a lot of different uh, elements can be used so all of these particles probably have different targets in a cell so some of them will bind to mitochondria some of them can bind to uh, cell membrane, some of them can bind to different proteins and all of this should be studied in order to use these nanoparticles uh, in your practice in different biological applications. So, and even if we take, for example, just a single silver nanoparticles, it still, uh, it still have different impact on different uh, organism and the uh, title for this article does the complexity of biological system matters uh, well it definitely matter because uh, for example for fungi and for bacteria silver nanoparticles are very toxic it's not a, <laughs> not the first time we observe this result but yes indeed it's very toxic for the cells but if we look for example on virus and uh, on human or animal cells uh, there's almost same toxicity so if you want to produce some uh, antibacterial not antibacterial antivirus uh, antivirus for example washing for your hands for example again coronavirus uh, it is completely uh, useless to take some silver nanoparticles because uh, it can be either two ways uh, it's uh, it cannot it cannot kill virus or it can kill human uh, human cells so your epithelium cells along with the virus so if you ever will see some antivirus uh, antivirus uh, washing uh, liquid with silver silver particles please do not use it it's either uh, useless or toxic and uh well next one is functionalization so when you produce your particles uh, you will probably need i just check a couple of things about how many people listening okay enough enough people listening so uh, if we look uh, on your particles when we uh, when we obtain some particles we definitely need to cover them with something so to give them some functions and this is called functionalization. So if we look on functionalization strategies, uh, there is a lot of them, uh, and uh, it's just a small glance on what can be really used. So it can be dendrimers, polyethylene glycol, different markers, antibodies, peptides, double single-stranded RNAs, small RNAs, small interfering RNA, septomers, drugs, and a lot, a lot of different things. Uh, and some of them can be used uh, along with uh, each other. So you can add some drug, you can use some fluorescent dye, uh, and this can be called a seronostic approach. So diagnosis and therapy in one particle. So uh, it was very, uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, very important maybe 10 years ago, but for now it's, uh, not so state of, uh, of the art to create some diagnostic approach. It's already a past century. Uh, but if we look on functionalization, uh, it's not very easy because when you functionalize your particles with something, you need to assess its toxicity once again because adding any of the molecules, for example, polythene glycol was used, I don't know, for decades and uh, some nanoparticles can be toxic to cell and when you coat them with polyethylene glycol it become non-toxic but uh, non-toxic only for these cells but what about a whole organism what about other cells uh, so the non-toxicological uh, non-toxicity uh, non studies uh, they are very uh, complicated because when you change some type of uh, some uh, some type of nanoparticles to another type you need to assess 
every toxicity profile from the very beginning. So it's uh, not that easy we just cover, it, uh, cover your nanoparticle and pack and everything will go all right. Probably yes, but not. Uh, and if we talk about pigulation, uh, pigulation uh, was used like, so pigulation is uh, covering your particles or proteins or something in PEC shell uh, or just conju uh, conjugation with PEC molecules. So there's a lot of PEC molecules with different molecular weights. So it can be very small molecules and it can be very long molecules. But uh, like maybe 40, maybe even 50 years ago, pigulation was everything. And well, to be honest, even 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, pigulation was everything. If you want to make your nanoparticles biocompatible for use in uh, animals uh, for something like, for any biological application, you just pigulate your particles. But for now, it's obvious that pigulation have some real drawbacks, and there's a lot of them, and uh, pigulation are not that good after all. Uh, so we will talk... Uh, about pigulation on our third lecture but uh, just for you to know a bit information pigulation if you use no pigulation for your particles they will definitely accumulate uh, almost all of them will definitely accumulate in liver uh, so it's a liver and if you use some pigulation uh, they will well they will uh, await uh, phagocytosis by macrophages and will definitely accumulate uh, somewhere else or they will stay in blood. Uh, that's why pigulation uh, was used for a longer blood circulation, basically. But when we're talking about different functionalization, uh, uh, I can say a couple of thoughts about protein corona. So protein corona is phenomena which were uh, discovered like maybe uh, two decades ago, or maybe like 17 years, 20 years ago. And protein corona is some kind of natural uh, functionalization. So if you inject some particles in your organism or human organism, animal organism, they will definitely will be covered by some proteins. And these proteins, there's a lot of them in our blood. We have, uh, uh, well, some hundreds of grams, maybe not hundreds, but a lot, uh, like maybe 70, 100 grams of proteins uh, per liter of our serum. So there's a lot of them like microglobulins, albumins, and so on, and they will definitely will cover the nanoparticles with this shell called protein corona. And this protein corona will affect the uh, cellular, uh, cellular uptake of these particles. And more important, if some of the protein will absorb on the surface of particle and then enter the cell, uh, it will uh, drag, this, uh, drag this protein with another particle. So uh, uh, it, uh, it's one of the possible way uh, to subject the cells for uh some proteins which are not uh, naturally will occur inside cytoplasm so uh probably it can cause to some overdose with proteins in separate cells and also can cause cell death so uh like as i said maybe 20 years ago uh no one ever heard of protein corona and uh, every scientist just thinks that uh, just thought that if they inject uh, pure gold nanoparticles inside a human organism, they will uh, circulate like a pure gold nanoparticles. Nope. Uh, and uh, if we talk, uh, we will talk about protein corona uh, later. So protein corona, not very easy formulation. So it can be a hard corona, it's soft corona, and this uh, protein corona can uh, undergo some evolution in human organism. So if nanoparticles will circulate for weeks, protein corona will not last for a weeks in, uh, in its initial stage. So it will be in some way transformed in something else. Uh, and uh, after all of this, we finally came to a testing. So now when you uh, use some nanoparticles in your research, it definitely needs some testing for well, biological application or maybe some environmental application. Maybe you need, uh, you want to use the, your nanoparticles to uh, clean some water wastes or something like this. Uh, and uh, anyway, these nanoparticles will probably uh, will probably 
uh, incorporate in some biological change. So it is always needed to test your particles for uh, some toxicity, nanotoxicity or just toxicity. And there's a lot of models to use for testing of nanoparticles. So test systems can be divided in well basically four groups but I think uh, different sciences have different designations. So the first uh, type of uh, system it's uh, in silico systems. So in silico it's something connected with computing. So it's just uh, it's just some computer models like computer modeling, drug screening uh, and uh, using in silico system you can predict different docking, uh, do uh, docking of your particles you can for example predict magnetic susceptibility of your particle using MATLAB or COMSOL you can predict uh, hydrodynamical behavior of course it's just a computer model so they can be 100% accurate but still they can be used to eliminate even some in vivo uh, in vivo testing. So in silico for now it's one of the uh, most developed things uh, in uh, nanoparticles testing and there's a lot of system developed in recent years because in silico testing uh, needs a lot of computer power. So for now it's a lot of supercomputers which can be used for in silico uh, testing applications. Uh, if you talk about in vitro, uh, in vitro testings, uh, well, there's uh, like must be in every article which describes some nanoparticles. So cell cultures, cell spheroids, different type of artificial tissues, uh, different microfluidics devices, uh, bioprinted scaffolds and so on. So in vitro is something out of the organism, but uh, constructed uh, even constructed without using an organism. So cell cultures there, well, some time ago they they were taken out of a human organism, but uh, this was like 70 years ago. So they can be considered as in vitro model. But there's also ex vivo models. Ex vivo organ, uh, ex, ex vivo model is uh, usually some dissected organs. Uh, well, here it's not ex vivo, it's just transplantation of lungs, I believe, or something like this. Uh, but well, ex vivo testing uh, usually looks something like this. So you can dissect, for example, a vessel. You can, dis uh, you can dissect uh, even a whole heart from a rat. Uh, plug it into a circulatory system, artificial system, and test some of your formulations, some of your particles on a uh, beating heart. So it can be called ex vivo. So everything that, uh, that were cut out of organism and use it immediately for testing uh, can be called ex vivo testing. So even, even post-surgical materials. So, for example, we sometimes uh, testing our thrombolytic drugs on uh, cutted uh, human clots, human thrombus. So, it also can be called ex vivo. And in some, some time, sometime, it's a very narrow uh, object to discuss, primary cell cultures. Primary cell cultures is something that taken out of uh, an organism. So. Uh, if someone have a tumor inside uh, inside organism, you can take a biopsy of this uh, with the cells and use them as a test. Uh, for example, for personal uh, personalized medicine. So uh, primary cell cultures can be partially, uh, very partially uh, considered as a ex vivo models. But uh, I uh, probably will. Uh, probably will call them uh, still in vitro models, so it's on the border. And in vivo models, it's not uh, very hard to understand. It's some animals, uh, insects. Why not to use insects if you produce some particles, for example, uh, to use on your plants? Uh, will this cause a die of some bees, for example? Uh, embryos, uh, larvas. So all of these, uh, all. Uh, all organisms that are living on its own uh, can be called in vivo object. Again, uh, a very tricky question. 
unicellular organisms so like bacteria well bacteria still can be called in vitro but there's not only bacteria which can be unicellular and uh, just a couple slides later we will discuss this organism too so if we look on in vitro uh, what can be assessed uh, in vitro there's a lot of things that you can uh, assess uh, using in vitro techniques uh, basically you can uh, build uh, I believe there should be something here. Okay, let, okay. Uh, so you can assess a lot of things using in vitro techniques. Uh, basically, you can uh, uh, visual visual visualize. Uh, okay, you can image <laughs> cell morphology uh, with different fluorescent dyes. Uh, you can basically assess uh, cell morphology, cell viability, and cell proliferation. And uh, for all of these methods, I will devote like lecture six and lecture seven, I think. Uh, you can build even some very complicated in vitro models like lab on a chip uh, that will, uh, and we will discuss uh, just again a couple slide, uh, slides later. But uh, when you're using different in vitro models, uh, it is very hard to compare the results because even if you use different unicellular models like yeasts, uh, mammalian cells, different uh, algas and bacteria uh, and study for example the toxicity of silver nanoparticles uh, the result will be very different but not always uh, because protection system for uh, most of the organism are the same. It uh, you know, contains some glutathione, uh, digidohinases, uh, and other protection systems. And when you're assessing uh, the viability of these uh, cells, uh, you basically use some tests like LDHSA or MTT assay, and these uh, pathways, uh, like converting MTT to a colored formazan, uh, they are almost the same for all of these cells. So uh, the question is uh, not about assessing here, but uh, about uh, picking up a right model for your particles. So if you want to use your particles in some, I don't know, water reservoirs or in lakes, I uh, definitely need to be assessed on, for example, on alga, but not on mammalian cells or on not on yeast, for example. Uh, and all of this, uh, I mean, uh, observation of uh, toxicity uses this LDH assay, so it's basically a metabolic assay. So uh, metabolic assay gives you just uh, indirect information. So they're breathing or not breathing. So mitochondria works or not works, but it's not a direct observation of particle variability. To observe a direct, uh, to perform a direct observation, you need to look on your cells, well, with your eyes. And direct observation uh, usually involves some fluorescent dyes, uh, microscopic observation, uh, even uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy observation, uh, which helps to observe your cells directly and uh, understand why, for example, this particle is toxic. For example, if you look on this picture, this is a colocalization picture, so-called, so colocalization of particles and cells. And if you look, for example, on the cell, on separate cell, uh, uh, blue staining for nucleus, and all of the all of this uh, light gray color, and especially these white dots, it's nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles are around the nucleus. And if you are familiar with cell uh, structure, uh, mitochondria mostly uh, localized around the nucleus. So probably it's a colocalization of nanoparticles with mitochondria. And if this nanoparticles is toxic, probably toxicity uh, associated with damage to mitochondria. So to energy cells of our uh, energy uh, factories of our cells. So looking only on one picture can give you an answer why your particles is toxic so it's not as complicated as it can uh, looks for uh, at the first glance uh, and uh, as i said there's a lot of things on the border uh, 
uh, when I said about unicellular objects, there's a lot of objects uh, which are living on its own, like for example this one, it's a uh, moving algas, and well, using moving algas, uh, unicellular algas, you can assess some uh, not just uh, metabolic activity, but you also can assess movement, for example, of fluorescence of chlorof uh, chlorophyll, uh, for example, like this one, uh, where red, uh, red cells fluorescent and they are living, and uh, blue cells, they are already dead. So using these objects, uh, some scientists call uh, these objects in vivo because when you're working only with alga well for you alga it's uh, like a bigger like a rat eye like a mouse so you can call them in vivo but for the scientists who working with animals alga is just a uh, well it's in vitro object uh, and sometimes uh, on the border you can obtain uh, uh, i mean on the border between direct and indirect ways. For example, if you stain your particles for hydrogen peroxide staining, it's both, uh, both uh, indirect and direct observation because you directly observe the cells with your eyes, but indirect because concentration of uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, not always correlate with viability of your cells. Uh, well, again, in details, we will discuss this uh, a bit later and we move in to a short video just for me to, uh, let's say, rest for a couple of minutes uh, and uh, the video devoted to lab on a chip. It's a very nice thing. I, I suppose uh, most of you heard about lab on a chip, but again, maybe some of you didn't hear it, so please watch a very, very short video. This is the idea of replacing animal studies for drug testing, for example, with little micro-engineered devices that are lined by human cells and reconstitute organ-level functions. One of the things that pharmaceutical industry is finding is that they're having very high failure rates, and often it's because the animal models being used to develop these drugs are not predictive of the human situation. It's very expensive to perform animal studies and also time consuming. Whereas here we have models that can potentially better predict the human situation. Uh, it's called the human breathing lung on a chip uh, and this device mimics a breathing human lung. It has human airway cells from the air sac on a membrane that's porous. On the other side of the membrane are human capillary blood vessel cells. There's air on one side, there's flowing medium with human blood cells in it, like blood on the other side, on the capillary side, and then the whole thing stretches and relaxes just like our lung does when we breathe. And we mimic you know, various types of physiological responses to drugs, toxins, or various types of materials that we encounter on a daily basis. So this would be very useful because it's human relevant, because we will be using human cells. And I think the beauty of this technology is so easy and straightforward that a lot of people can use it without getting trained, especially biologists, clinicians, you know, chemists, you know, who don't have any engineering background. This technology is accessible to them. Much cheaper than using animal models. To see the size, you need very little compound. So this would not only be more predictive, but have higher turnaround times. You can screen using much smaller amounts of the drugs too. So more predictive and more practical. But we also have kidney on a chip, bone marrow on a chip, peristalsis and gut on a chip, and we're just going on organ to organ and hopefully integrating them in a little microsystem. We link the heart that beats to the lung that breathes. We're getting great interest from pharmaceutical industry and hope to announce our first alliance to use those to see if we can indeed replace some animal studies to accelerate the drug development process and decrease costs. This institute is by far the greatest and you know best working environment for bioengineering research and we can predict the behavior or response of these cells or the body to, for example, drugs more precisely. I think that's where the, the promise is. So, 
uh, Labuna chip. Uh, it's a very nice thing and probably you can create even a whole human on a chip with some hair, some lungs, uh, some, uh, well, where the heart is, mm, probably somewhere heart, guts uh, and so on. But for now, there's a lot of techniques to produce this lab on a chip, uh, organs on a chip, uh, human on a chip. No, but they are not uh, very still, despite a lot of effort put in this technology, it's still very not as cheaper as it described. So uh, it's uh, for me still it's looking like a toy, probably. Uh, because uh, even, uh, for example, for lung tissue, uh, even in a condition when this lung tissue is breathing and so on, uh, when you put these nanoparticles in an organism or in animal organism, there's a lot of other things that are uh, involved in biodistribution of these particles and toxicity of this particle. So uh, lab on a chip definitely better than just cell cultures uh, or even cell spheroids or something like this. No, but at the current state of technology, it can substitute animal, still cannot uh, substitute animal testing. And that's why we're moving to, well, final thing, uh, it's in vivo testing. Uh, and I, I, ho I will not show you, uh, I will not show you a very, uh, very, un, uh, I don't know, unkindly uh, pictures, but still there's something that, uh, may be not suitable for everyone. Uh, <laughs> okay, so animal testing for now, it's uh, in vivo testing, it's necessary for a lot of different application, uh, pharmaceutics, cosmetics. And uh, if we talk about cosmetics, there's a lot of concerns about using, for example, monkeys uh, to test some nail polish and something like this, but still, now, uh, if you want to perform some experiments on humans, for now you must perform some experiments on animals before it. Uh, and uh, in uh, our current situation, considering coronavirus, uh, you see a lot of companies trying to uh, trying to make a first vac vaccine for uh, against coronavirus. Uh, and uh, well, some of them even skipping this preliminary, uh, as it's called, like uh, preclinical examination on different in vivo models. Well, uh, there's a lot of talks about this because when we look on particular experiments, uh, especially connected with treating of tumors, some experiments really looks not very uh, not very, uh, from a humanity point of view, when you're looking on this pure, uh, poor uh, mice with a very big solid tumors, uh, well, it's our current situation. We times a research is trying to eliminate as many animals uh, as possible from experiments. Uh, I mean, eliminate, not just eliminate, but uh, try to use something except animals. And there's a lot of uh, very complex in vitro models like lab on a chip uh, but well we will uh, we will not discuss in vivo testing in this course uh, because i believe you at least part of you already let's just switch in another slide so i believe some of you already had this course of preclinical uh, preclinical studies this spring uh, i think uh, some of you maybe not all uh, and uh, basically, it will be our last slide about natural nanoparticles. Uh, what I mean about natural nanoparticles, uh, some of this information will be given to you in our last lecture, I think. Uh, and this last lecture will be devoted to different concerns about uh, environmental pollution with nanoparticles. Uh, because for now it's already obvious that uh, a lot of nanoparticles can be naturally produced by, for example, wind erosion, by volcanic activity, uh, by different uh, bacteria, and even can be produced by, uh, can be acute from a cosmos. 
So uh, it's a lot of natural ways for nanoparticles to occur and a lot of them, for example, uh, are produced by different mines. For example, cup uh, copper mines, uh, iron mines, they produce a lot of different dust and this dust uh, mainly consisted from different particles, not, uh, not just, uh, uh, well, every dust have some elemental, uh, elemental structure like uh, alumina or something like this. Uh, and uh, in some industrial countries with, with a heavy, uh, heavy industry, there's a lot of research is devoted for uh, environmental pollution from uh, mines uh, and from uh, wind erosion. So, and uh, if you're talking about microplastic, so it's a macroplastic, microplastic, and uh, even nanoplastic. So, uh, if this microplastic will decompose uh, a bit further, it can turn to nanoplastic, and this is a whole new world to uh, research how this nanoplastic will transform, uh, will pass through a biological chains, food chains. Uh, and uh, how it can affect a human uh, organism or plant organism, plants, uh, animal organism, and so on. Uh, so it's a lot of um, research is now devoted to um, uh, environmental pollution with nanoparticles in Europe and USA. No, sadly, not in our country, but I hope that uh, in some way the situation will change in the future. Uh, so for uh, today introduction lecture, I think I'm a bit out of time, but uh, I hope you find it useful. At least uh, I think you find uh, some answers for already find some answers for introductory test. Uh, and well, that's all I want to give to you today. Uh, if you have any questions, you are free to ask them in chat. I will try to answer to them. And uh, if you have some questions regarding uh, organization of this course about again presentation topics and so on uh, please return to the start of the lecture and listen or can you or you can ask me now didn't see any questions so if you have no questions you are free to go let's say I just monitoring the amount of people so when most of you leave I will just end the lecture it's one of the uh, most useful options in uh, online lecturing It just maybe not very suitable for you to type a bigger question, so you are free to ask after the lecture if you want. You can just type plus in chat for me to wait if you want to type something bigger. If nothing then nothing so next lecture will be this friday we will talk about synthesis uh, and i kindly ask you to fill uh, this form i mean this one on a google drive so in this form you need to put your object of research very short so design of composite based on tiny dioxide and present priority cultures very nice so please everyone Put your object here so I will give you a report topic and you can check this report topic maybe tomorrow and start preparing your presentation and report so on next uh, after ne uh, on next lecture I or you uh, by yourself will choose who will present uh, a first presentation uh, on the next week on next Tuesday if nothing if there's nothing you want to ask me that's all for today thank you for your attending and uh, see you next friday